Okay, this is uh, Physics 1B for September 14th. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the topics that are listed here. We're actually, after I went through and prepared everything, I overestimated what we would do. We won't be talking about heat transfer today. And I don't know if we'll talk about colorimetry, but we'll definitely talk about temperature, uh, heat. Temperature and heat are kind of the general topics of the day. Uh, we'll talk about thermal equilibrium, different temperature scales here. Uh, then we'll move into talking about how things like metals expand and liquids uh, when they're heated. Uh, we'll talk about length expansion, volume expansion. And then with whatever time we have left, we'll start talking about calorimetry. We'll introduce the idea of these two different types of specific heat. Maybe you've seen this in a chemistry class, whether it be in high school or in uh, uh, college. And um, we'll talk about phase changes and solving for what happens when you pour water into a hot pot and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so we're shifting from, what did we talk about last week? Fluids for the last three weeks uh, and how they behave. And now we're specifically talking about really a property that a fluid might have or really any object such as temperature. And then how that temperature gets exchanged with other objects, which is the process of uh, like what we call heat. So let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, I took this picture from your guys' book in lieu of trying to draw it myself. And um, let's, uh, let's define what we mean by thermal equilibrium first, I guess, before looking at this picture. So uh, thermal equilibrium So two objects are basically um, in thermal equilibrium with each other if there is no exchange of uh, energy between the two of them. That's basically what thermal equilibrium means. I don't know if I need to write that down, but thermal equilibrium means there's no exchange of energy between the two systems or objects that you're describing. Okay. So when two objects are in thermal equilibrium, that means that there's no energy exchange. And um, so there's this thing uh, about thermal equilibrium that uh, has to do with three different systems. So what we have here are three systems, system A, system B, system C. They could be like a block of lead, a block of gold, a block of copper or something like that. Or it could be some chamber with gas in it. Doesn't really matter. It's just some system. And uh, in this picture, we have conductors and we have insulators. Do you guys know what those are? Certainly you do. What's the difference between a conductor and an insulator when it comes to thermal flow, flow of heat or something like this? Okay, so that's essentially right. The conductor is going to allow uh, heat exchange. Heat exchange is basically just an energy exchange due to a temperature difference. We haven't defined what temperature is yet, but I think you guys know what temperature is. Uh, so if you have a conductor, it's going to allow the flow of energy from system, Z, system B to system C in this case. The conductor on the left-hand side is going to allow the flow of energy from system A to system C. I could, I could make this a little bigger. Um, but the insulator is gonna, is gonna block the flow, okay? So the conductors could be something like what? What's an example of a conductor, a material that conducts heat? Metals, yeah, for sure. And what's an example of like an insulator? Okay, fiberglass or like styrofoam is a pretty good insulator, right? You see those big styrofoam uh, uh, coolers that you can buy at the store. Um, an insulator blocks the flow of heat, whether it's from cold to hot or hot to cold, right? So an insulator can keep things cold in the case of a cooler, or it can keep things warm in the case of like a, uh, you know, those big coffee cups, what are those called? Um, I don't know. What are the name of those coffee cups that have like the, the, the silver part on the outside? Do they have a name? What'd you call it? 
Thermos, yeah, thermos, exactly. So that's something that can keep uh, things hot and cold at the same time. Right? Okay, so uh, let's let's define what uh, we want to kind of prove from this here. So the idea here is just as it says in these these two tooltips that if systems A and B are in thermal equilibrium with system C, so A is in equilibrium with C, B is in equilibrium with C, then it must be the case that A and B are equal, in equilibrium with each other. Does that seem reasonable to you guys? This statement right here is called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, and I think I just yeah right here. So this is the zeroth law of thermodynamics. It says that if system C is initially in thermal equilibrium with both A and B, just like in this picture right here, then A and B are also in thermal equilibrium with each other. Does that make sense to you guys? Do you guys know why it's called the zeroth law? Why would you name something the zeroth law? It's kind of weird, right? Why would? Yeah, that's pretty much right. That's like apparently what the, the way it went down. Okay, so you had you, there's going to be three laws of thermodynamics that we're going to learn later, first, second, and third, and then this one was realized later to be very important, and so they, they had to call it the zero law. Um, so now to take this into something that hopefully you guys understand pretty well. Um, so if C, if system C is a thermometer, right, um, then whatever the temperature that's read out by system C is, it must be the same as the temperature of A and the temperature of B, right? So that leads us to the second statement of the, 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 therm the zeroth law, which is that two systems are in thermal equilibrium if and only if they have the same temperature. So we can make this really pretty simple here by saying, if we measure temperature, for example, on like the the Celsius scale, if this one's at 20 degrees Celsius, then this one's at 20 degrees Celsius. And this thing, if it was a thermometer, for example, it would read out that they're both at 20 degrees Celsius, right? The only way in which things do not exchange energy is if they have the same temperature, basically. Does that make sense? So for example, if you take uh, um, some coffee and you pour it into a cup, okay, and let's say the cup doesn't have a handle, when you touch the cup, right? Uh, the cup is going to be hotter than your hands. So as a result, um, the the hand, your hand and the cup are not in equilibrium with each other, right? So so what happens then? So you have you have a hot cup full of uh, coffee. So you have some hot substance. And then you touch that with your hand, which is definitely going to be cooler. So you touch this with your hand. We'll just draw a person. Like a stick figure to make it simple. So they touch the coffee with their hand, or they touch the out, outer portion of the cup with their hand. Um, what happens in terms of uh, temperature? What happens in terms of uh, the hot object versus the cold object here? What happens to your hand? Your hand gets warmer, exactly, right? So as a result of some, touching something that's hot, your hand is going to get warmer, right? Your hand will heat up. Now, of course, there's only so long that you can hold the cup before your hand feels pain to the point where maybe you're going to have to, like, take your hand off of it. But given enough time, your hand and the cup and the liquid that's inside of it would eventually all reach some kind of an equilibrium, right? Like, given enough time, the cup will cool down, uh, the, the water will cool down, and then all of them will be at the same temperature. And when they're all at the same temperature, that defines thermal equilibrium, right? Okay, so temperature becomes, uh, so if C is the thermometer, then it measures temperature, right? And temperature becomes a way of deciding when the thermal transfer is going to occur, right? All right, let's talk about thermometers in general, okay? So, uh, so given that we know that, that you can use a third object to define a scale, of temperatures, how do you go about doing that? It ends up being pretty simple. Uh, if you want to design a thermometer, uh, you can take uh, some reference fluid. So for example, water. So you take uh, three different scenarios, um, really just two, right? So you take two vessels, you fill them with water. 
Uh, one of them you put ice into, so one of them you've got ice cubes sitting inside of it. So this ends up being ice water. The other one you put over some kind of a stove and you heat it up. So we heat this one up so that the water ends up boiling. So this ends up being like boiling water. So you have boiling water and ice water. And then we get a thermometer. Okay, so what's the thermometer gonna be? Well, there's multiple ways that we can construct thermometers. The one that you're probably the most familiar with would be the type where you've got, uh, what's a good color for this? We'll use this. Um, where you've got some kind of a glass and it has a well of some type of a liquid at the bottom. Um, a long time ago, they were filled with um, mercury. Nowadays, they're usually filled with alcohol. Um, so you have some kind of a liquid. It's contained within the glass and you put it into the boiling water and there's there's like a cavity inside that allows this liquid to expand and fill up the tube. This doesn't look that great. The point is that at some point, there's gonna be a maximum reading that you get over here. And for the Celsius scale, what you do is you just call that 100 degrees Celsius and you say that's the temperature of boiling water, right? You mark, you just literally, you take this tube, and you, you get some liquid in here like alcohol that can expand with temperature. And then you put in this tube and you look at where it comes to and you mark it 100 degrees Celsius, right? And then you take the exact same object, you put it into here. So here's our here's our little tube. And you figure out where that where that alcohol goes to now, or mercury, or whatever's in here. And it's gonna go to some point here. And you mark that point off, and you just call that zero degrees Celsius. And now you've constructed a thermometer. What else do you need to do? If you wanna get this thing to actually be able to read things, you need to do one other thing with your piece of glass here. What else would you need to do? So assumingly, what you do is you start off with a glass. It's got this alcohol inside of it, right? Um, before you put it into here, it doesn't have any markings on it at all. You've put two markings on here, right? What else would you need to do to finish this off to make it a real thermometer that can measure like, I don't know, to measure 70 degrees Celsius? What would you need to do? Where would 70 occur between 0 and 100? That question makes sense? Did I talk too much? Could this be used to measure things other than the, just these two situations if it only shows 0 and 100? What else would you need to do to the thermometer? What's, oh, shoot. I'm so sorry. Thank you for saying that. I forget that um, I get stuck on my other classes chat whenever I... Yeah, okay. Lots of answers. There you go. Divide markings, mark it more. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, so you come in here and you'd mark off like, you know, 10 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, and so on and so forth until you got all the way up to 100. If you divide it into 10 markings, then you'd get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 degrees Celsius, and then you just do more markings, right? And now you've got a thermometer, okay? It's pretty simple, right? All right, so there's other types of scales. Uh, the other scale that we're kind of used to in America is the, the Fahrenheit scale. Um, you know, you may need to, from time to time, convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. This is an example of how you do that. You put the temperature in Celsius on the right, multiply by 9 fifths, you add 32, because 32 degrees, what does 32 degrees in the Fahrenheit scale represent? Um, that's really, I mean, I, you're trying to say it's like the freezing point of water? Is that what you mean by that? So 32 degrees Celsius corresponds to, sorry, 32 degrees Fahrenheit corresponds to 0 degrees Celsius because that's the point at which water freezes. And if you plug in uh, 100 degrees Celsius into this equation right here, you'll end up getting 180 plus 32, which is, what's the um, what's the boiling point of water? And um, it's 212, right? Yeah, exactly. So 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And then an arbitrary, you know, scaling between those two. So this kind of tells you that the, the individual markings on a Celsius thermometer would not coincide with the individual markings on a Fahrenheit thermometer. Um, you know, why, I don't know what the historical, like like where the Fahrenheit scale came from. I, don't, I didn't read anything about that before class. I'm sure I read about it before, but maybe you guys don't. Does anyone here know? What's the, what's the historical like reasoning behind these strange numbers of 32 and 212? It's probably because they didn't design this scale based on ice water and boiling water, right? It was based on something else probably. Do you want to know what it was based on? 
Maybe that's something you guys can go look up. Whether you look it up now or not, doesn't really matter. Uh, if you need to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius, you just solve this equation the other direction, right? Uh, certainly you guys can, can do simple calculations like this, right? Okay, so we've got this idea of a thermometer, thermal equilibrium, right? Um, now, uh, one thing about the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales is that they can actually be negative. Um, you know, the Celsius scale can easily go go negative here, so can Fahrenheit. Um, but uh, there's another type of scale when you look at um, systems of gases, and instead of measuring um, temperature by using thermal expansion, instead what you do is you measure temperature by uh, um, the pressure of a gas contained in a, in a solid uh, volume. So um, something you, you probably know something about from chemistry is that as you increase the pressure of a gas, say it the other way, as you increase the temperature of a gas in a solid container, what happens to the, the temperature? So I have some fixed container. Within it, I have like, let's say, I don't know, hydrogen. And we increase the temperature. Um, so if the temperature uh, increases of the of this solid thing here, what happens to the pressure? Yeah, the pressure increases. And it does so in kind of a uniform and natural kind of way, um, where you can basically create a ratio that if I know what the temperature is at one point, at one temperature scale, and I divide by that uh, by um, temperature at another point, this ends up being equal to um, the ratio of the pressures. And this allows us to kind of plot this on a, on a diagram. And that's this right here. A lot of stuff on this diagram, so we'll just kind of go through it. I'll make it a little bit bigger. So chemists in, I want to say 18th century, but it may have been before this, they started creating these, uh, so this is a constant volume gas thermometer, okay? So the bulb here has some gas at a fixed volume, and it's being placed into presumably probably some ice water or something like this. And then right here at the top, it's reading out temperature. And if you can't read that, it's, it's pretty blurry. Um, so if you, if you look at the way that this gas interacts at just different temperatures, um, and you plot pressure on the y-axis here versus temperature right here on the, uh, the x-axis, and you'll notice it's in degrees Celsius on the top, then for different types of gases, if you go out and you basically just, you take a bunch of data points, right? You're like, oh, I noticed that at, I don't know, 50 degrees Celsius, it has a certain pressure. And I, I take another gas and I notice at 50 degrees Celsius, it has this pressure. And at 50 degrees Celsius, the other one has this pressure. And then I go and I, I measure the temperature of the gas or the pressure of the gas at zero degrees Celsius for each of them. Remarkably, you know, I don't know what these gases are supposed to represent here, but it's three different gases, okay? Like this one could be like hydrogen, this one could be like oxygen, and this one could be, I don't know, like CO2 or something like this. Um, you've got three different gases, right? I don't know, this this is just, I'm just picking random things. Just so you know that each of these curves, or lines as it turns out, happens to represent different gases. And these, these chemists, they notice that uh, if you take these things and you plot them, that all of those gases, if you plot them backwards, they all tend to meet at a certain point. And the point that they meet at is negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. So that temperature, negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, uh, is kind of given a new name. And you'll notice, what's the pressure at this point right here? You could call it the, if, you're, if this was like an algebra class, you'd call this the x-intercept, right? Because it's the place where the graph, these pink lines actually meet the... Uh, What's the pressure at this location? It says it on the picture, but I know you might not be reading. It's zero, right? So at that temperature, and I'll label this as like a T with a C to indicate that it's degrees Celsius, even though it says degrees Celsius. Um, at that temperature, um, the pressure happens to be equal to zero. Zero, whatever unit you want. It can be zero atmospheres, it can be zero pascals, whatever you want, but it's zero, no, no matter what, uh, yeah. So the idea would be, at that temperature, it seems as though the gas no longer exerts any pressure on its container, not at all. 
And so that unique phenomenon led them to believe that this temperature must be the lowest achievable possible temperature. And they defined this temperature to be what's called, you guys know the name for it, right? What's it called? Absolute zero. Kelvin's the name of the scale. Absolute zero is the name of the, uh, just like the temperature itself. So it's called absolute zero. And that means that you can construct a scale called the Kelvin scale, like you're mentioning, wherein you just define this to be zero. So temperature in Kelvin. Now, I don't like the way they put this here with the T with the K subscript, because usually when we talk about Kelvin temperature, at least in a lot of the other textbooks that I've seen, whether they be undergraduate, graduate, whatever, we just use the symbol T because Kelvin scale is the, um, it's the SI scale for, me for, for measuring temperature. So I'm probably just going to use the symbol T when I'm talking about Kelvin. I might use the symbol T when we're talking about temperature differences in Celsius too. But uh, um, so at that temperature, it's T equal to zero Kelvin. And with Kelvin, there's no degree symbol here. It's just zero Kelvin, right? And then you can redefine some things. So the boiling point of water then ends up just being, you can use this equation right here to figure out what it would be. The temperature in Celsius is 100, right? So the temperature in Kelvin would be 373 Kelvin, about. And then the freezing point of water would be zero plus this, or, you know, the freezing point of water then is going to be exactly 273.15 Kelvin. So this would be the freezing point or the melting point. Is it the same? So you've got this this Kelvin temperature scale, and it works off the idea that there's this absolute zero. It means that on the Kelvin scale, there's no such thing as negative temperature, right? As far as we know, I, I don't know that there's any uh, any way in which you can get negative temperature on the Kelvin scale. Um, because at that point, at least according to our graph, what would that mean? What happened to the pressure if you went if you went into the negatives on the Kelvin scale? Right. See, on this on the Kelvin scale, this is the zero point, right? You get negative pressure, and I don't know what that means. What do you guys know about negative pressure? What would that mean exactly? Negative pressure. Mm. Why would you choose expand? I would think it'd be the opposite. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so pressure that like the gas so let's think about this little bulb right here there's gas in here and exerts outward pressure on the surfaces right so when you say expand that, that confuses me because then i'm thinking isn't that what regular pressure would be right regular pressure would be that the object exerts a force on its container right ruja says it's pushing in on itself instead of out yeah maybe something like that i don't know but it's definitely a, a weird idea because every type of time we've talked about pressure, it always involves some force being applied perpendicular to an area. If you have negative pressure, yeah, again, I, I don't really know what that's supposed to mean. All right, so uh, we have the Kelvin temperature scale. Um, we, we call the zero point uh, of Kelvin absolute zero. We believe it's the coldest achievable temperature. We've gotten pretty close to producing this temperature in um, the laboratory. I think we've gotten down to the order of nano kelvins or something like this. Like, I think the lowest temperatures that we've achieved are either pico or nano kelvins. So like the lowest temperature that we've ever actually produced in the laboratory um, is something on the order of like um, nano kelvin. So 10 to the negative nine kelvin, so very, very close. Or it's pico kelvin, I don't know. These things kind of always, um, seem to we get we get colder and colder and colder temperatures uh all the time but uh pico would be 10 to the negative 12 very close to absolute zero we've never actually achieved in a laboratory though i don't know that we ever will maybe we will um you might think uh the temperature of space would be close to absolute zero but it's not temperature in space is closer to like three to four kelvin um so yeah so it's a very hard to achieve thing another thing i would mention about this is uh one thing you might think is, um, since temperature, okay, here we go. Someone's saying something. Ruja says, isn't it impossible to reach because of a law in quantum physics? What do you, what do you know about that? What about quantum physics tells you that it's impossible to reach that?
Okay, so let's let's t- like take on some of the things you're saying there. The first thing you said was um, there's a law in quantum physics that says that uh, you can't know the exact location of a particle. That's not that's not exactly what it says, but you're it's like close. What's that law called or principle? Any of you guys know? It's named after a guy named Heisenberg. Yeah, Heisenberg and puzzle. It says it says that, uh, and this is like stuff you learn about in 1D, but usually people already know about it because you hear about it in some math, uh, physics class or math class. It says that you can't precisely know both the position and momentum of a particle. So if you know the position really well, you don't know its momentum very well. And if you know its momentum really well, that, that makes the uncertainty in the uh, position really well, really high. Okay. Um, okay, so there's that. The next thing you said was that if you reach absolute zero, the particle should not be moving, right? Which means you're connecting temperature to energy effectively, saying that um, temperature is a measurement on a macroscopic scale of how fast all the molecules are moving on average, right? Have you guys heard that before, that temperature is basically a measurement of average kinetic energy of molecules? Does that sound something familiar to you? Okay. So and that's true, and it's something that we're going to use, I think it's like the, the next chapter or the chapter after that, where we're talking about the microscopic scale, where we want to connect what is temperature on the microscopic scale. And we're going to say, basically, it's, it's the average kinetic energy of your system. Um, so to, to connect that back to absolute zero, then you were saying, OK, well, that means if temperature is related to motion, energy, kinetic energy, then at absolute zero, does that mean that the particles are not moving? So the question would be, at absolute zero, at zero Kelvin, are the particles not moving? What do you guys think? If they exert zero pressure, which is what, um, which is what this picture appears to imply, right? If they exert zero pressure, how could you have that, right? So imagine a container, and I tell you that within this container, I guess we have to close it off, because if it escapes, then it's going to warm and stuff like that. I've got a molecule in here, and I tell you this molecule is not going to exert any pressure on this chamber. Well, how would that happen? I mean, certainly if the molecule has even a tiny bit of motion, it's going to hit the side of the container, right? And it's going to bounce off and that process of bouncing off the wall of the container, right, will definitely, you know, send a little bit of impulse, which is a force, right? And force divided by area gives you the pressure, right? So it seems like this is true, right? If the pressure is zero, I, I, I have, maybe you guys can imagine it. Can you imagine a way in which the pressure is zero, but the particles are still moving? That's hard for me to, that's hard for me to picture personally. Now, classically, from a completely classical perspective, you, you introduced quantum physics, so I'm going to talk about it, but from a completely classical perspective, I believe this is what a classical physicist would say, a physicist from the 18th century, is that, well, if it's zero pressure, if, if this plot truly can be extrapolated back like this, and if there's no change in the curve, which there might be a change in the curve back here, right? Because you're reaching this limit, and sometimes when you reach a limit, you reach you create asymptotes and stuff like that. Like, so from a classical physics perspective, they would say the particles uh, are not moving. So classical physics, they would say, are the particles not moving? No, they're not moving. Or yes, they are not moving. I don't know how to answer that question. But from a quantum perspective, what we learn is that even when an object has a... Um, even when an object is at absolute zero, the, the laws of quantum physics tell us that those particles still technically have to be moving. So even at absolute zero, the particles are still going to be moving, which means there's still going to be some kind of measurable amount of pressure. So whether this is truly a zero pressure state, I don't know. We can't actually get to it, is the thing. Um, we can't actually get to it. So, but, but, but the laws of quantum mechanics tell us that even at absolute zero, the particles are still going to be moving. They have what's called a, a ground state of their energy, a lowest possible energy state, and that lowest possible energy state is not zero. It's uh, 
it's equal to Planck's constant multiplied by its frequency, basically. Or one half of it. Yeah. So, classically, the particles are not moving. Quantum mechanically, they're always moving. There's no way to stop it from moving. And to, to a certain extent, um, the difficulty to prove whether they're moving or not is related to the uncertainty principle that you mentioned as well. All right. All right, what do you guys think? Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. What you're going to learn is... Uh, in your um, your 1D class, I think some of you are probably taking 1D right now, right? Is anyone here taking 1D right now? I know you all missed a summer of classes, so a lot of people had to uh, double up. There's something called the the quantum simple harmonic oscillator. Now you guys know what a simple harmonic oscillator is, right? It's like it's like a mass on a spring or a pendulum or something like this. You learn that the energy states of this guy. Uh, they have this this relationship, and it's pretty simple, um, where there's an energy state that's given by the number n, and then I think it's multiplied by h bar, and then it's multiplied by the frequency of oscillation. So at the lowest possible energy state, n equal to zero, you still get one half h bar omega amount of energy, and the omega represents the frequency, i.e. how fast your molecule is oscillating back and forth, right? Remember, oscillators, they, they have a period, right? They go back, forth, and then back to the original position. Again, that's one oscillation. And one oscillation is, takes the time of a period, and you can say that the omega is 2 pi over 2. The point is that even when n is equal to 0, you still get this ground state energy. And as a result, the particles never stop moving, basically. They're always going to have some type of uh, minimal energy. And if they have some type of minimal energy, to some extent, they must have some kind of a temperature, you would think. But presumptively, we could we could design some experiment eventually, get something to zero Kelvin. Um, so I, this is a complete sidetrack. Hmm, what is that? Did it go away? Good. So why is it so hard? So I tell you that the lowest temperature that we've reached in the laboratory is, and, and to some extent, this really is the lowest temperature, right? I, I, I wrote, I meant when I wrote lowest temperature, I meant lowest temperature in a laboratory, but... All there is in science is what we measure, and even if we can predict the existence of some theoretical absolute zero, if the only thing we can actually truly reach in a laboratory is is this, well then that for now is the lowest temperature that we know about, right? Like we can have a theoretical low temperature of zero, but the reality is this is as low as we can get it. Why is it hard? Why is it hard to just reach out? Why can't we just drop the temperature of something down to absolute zero? The same way you can turn the volume in your car all the way down to zero or why, why is it difficult to get to absolute zero? How do we cool things down, usually? Energy equilibrium, so you're tying it back to what we said kind of earlier here. You have to remove a lot of energy from the system. Yeah, and then how do you do that? How, okay, let's say you have, let's say you go to the store, you buy a 12-pack of soda, and it's warm, and you want to cool it down. How do you how do you normally cool things down? Put it in the fridge. And why does that work? It's a really simple question, but I mean, I, it's important to... Why does it work that it gets colder when you put it in the fridge? It's not a complicated answer. I'm, I'm not looking for anything... The fridge is cold, right? It has a lower temperature... And so when you put the object that's hotter in the thing that has lower temperature, given enough time, you're going to get thermal equilibrium. They'll have the same temperature, right? So when you the next time you pull that soda out of the fridge, it, you guys are giving some ex explanations as to how the fridge gets cool, but that's not what I'm looking at. The main way in which you cool something down is you find something colder than it, and you put it into, you put it into contact with it, right? That's, that's the answer, right? You find something colder, and you put it into contact with it. So if I want to cool something down to zero Kelvin... I need something at zero Kelvin, at the very least. I would need something already at zero Kelvin, like a refrigerator, like a super ice box that's, that's set to zero, to, that's set to absolute zero, and then I could put my soda in there, and it would cool the soda down to the coldest temperature possible, right? But then you'd ask, well, how did you produce this device that's at zero Kelvin? You must have had some other device that was already at zero Kelvin, right? 
so you, you kind of create this uh, never-ending trail of like, well, how did you how did you how did you produce your zero Kelvin temperature uh, refrigerator? Because you would have had to have had um, something that was already that cold. So so it's, to some extent, you're going to reach a limit to which that works anymore, right? We can always go and find colder and colder substances, right? Liquid nitrogen is a very cold substance that we can use to cool things down, right? But it, it has a certain temperature, right? And um, so in order to get things truly close to absolute zero, you have to find other methods other than just contact or conductive cooling. Um, anyone know anything about what they do to make things even colder? Yeah, you do know. Usually people don't know the answer to that question. That's good. They, they cool them to, it's laser cooling, right? They, uh, they shoot the particle with a laser and it has some cancellation of energy. And so instead of the normal idea of a laser heating something up, these lasers are tuned to cool things down. And so that's how they reach these super cool temperatures. And they find different states of matter at really cold temperatures. You guys are probably familiar with like solid liquid and gas and then plasma. Um, and maybe you're familiar with other types of, but uh, at a very, very cold temperature, um, certain certain states of matter are produced as well. One of them is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and um, it only occurs very, very close to absolute zero. So you need to have a way to get there. Okay. Yeah, what's up? Mm-hmm. Of the particle? What do you mean where would it come from? The, mo the I, I would say the motion of the particle probably is where it's come from or? Where does it, yeah, I understand. No, I understand your question. I'm just thinking about it. Where does it get the energy to have this motion? From, yeah. Okay, I may be wrong about this, but I believe what someone like Planck would say is that um, it's, a, it's an inherent property of the particle itself. I don't know if that's an acceptable answer to you. <laughs> it's an inherent property of matter that um, So a quantum field, that, that word is probably pretty confusing to a lot of people. A quantum field is basically a uh, probability function. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any more. It's a probability function that describes the location and the momentum of the particle. And maybe some other things, such as the energy of the particle. Um, the quantum field itself is um, our way of describing the state of a system and how it's going to evolve. And, you know, one of the rules that we get out of studying these things is that you produce these, like, ground states. You should understand in physics, especially when it comes to quantum mechanics, we don't try to answer questions like why or... Um, your question was where does it come from, right? And let me, let me pose you with a different question that I think is probably similar. And I'm going to say this. I don't want to I mean to be snarky, but, like, let me ask a different question that has the has those words. Um, where did the universe come from? That's a question we could ask, right? Where did the universe come from? We don't have even remotely a good idea of how to answer that question. And, and in physics, people would say, well, it's not a question we're interested in physics. It's more of a philosophical question. Does that make sense? So I don't want to shut your question down because it's a really good question. And it's one of the things you have to think about when it comes to quantum mechanics is, is why is it like this? But in quantum mechanics, usually what we're trying to describe is the how. The... How is the wrong word too? Just we describe what happens, right? And the is, yeah, the is is a good way of putting it too. So to say where does the ground state energy come from? What's producing it? It's a fundamental property of the particle. Um, does that answer the question? It's a fundamental property. Just as much as um, what's a, what's another fu a fundamental property of the electron is its mass, right? And we have an idea now of how to describe what it is that gives a particle its mass. 
its interaction with the Higgs field. But um, that property of mass itself, we, we don't really know why it has the number that it has for any of the particles. You know what I mean? It's just a number, right? And then when it comes to energy states, again, we're talking about properties that are fundamental to the particles themselves, basically. And we observe those properties. We can describe how those properties interact with other properties, such as like how the energy interacts with, in this case, the frequency, and how the energy interacts with time intervals and scales like that. But we don't know anything more than how to describe it because quantum, me like classical mechanics, there's always a cause and effect, right? In quantum mechanics, um, the cause part becomes a little more, um, what's the word for it? Yeah, we stop, we stop caring so much about the causes and we start caring more about um, just observing state A and state B and, and just knowing how something goes from state A to state B. Yeah, so quantum mechanics is very strange. Um, in, in classical mechanics, you say there's a force. That force produces an acceleration. And now we can describe, based on what the position and initial velocity of the particle was, how a system will develop, i.e. like a baseball. You throw a baseball through the air. If you know the initial velocity, the angle it makes with the ground, you roughly know the path that it's going to take, right? Uh, and and that, that ceases to be the case in quantum mechanics. And that's why you get things like ground state energy. Anyway, so that's an interesting discussion. Do you guys have any other questions about that? I would highly encourage you, if you want to learn more about um, this stuff, to go read Feynman's lectures on physics and hop to the section on quantum mechanics. It'll give you a pretty good understanding of the philosophical dilemmas combined with the reality of, of what we do in, in modern physics. You'll learn about this stuff, obviously, in Physics 1D, but if you want to read about it now, you, know, you could read your textbook, but it's only so good. I would read uh, five lectures on physics. If you don't know what those are, if, do, when I say that, do you guys know what I'm talking about? I'm just going to pull this up and show you what I mean. I think I linked it in... Um, it might be linked on your page. Probably not, though. So there's just a website... It has all the things in here. Volume 3, Quantum Mechanics. Here you go. There's all this stuff. And it'll talk about um, really everything you need to know. It starts off with teaching you the kind of things that lead us to understand it. And then, yeah, all this stuff here. Okay, he says his phone's dying. So. All right, so let's move on. Um... What's next? Okay, so we talked about the Kelvin scale, so thermal expansion. That's the next topic, is thermal expansion. I'll probably introduce the theory of this, and we'll, come, we'll probably take a break, and we'll come back. I'm going this way. We could go this way. Make sure that I didn't have... Yeah, okay. So we're just going to grab all of these. So we want to talk now about thermal expansion. Okay, so thermal expansion is a pretty simple idea. It is the idea that if you heat something up, it's going to expand, and if you cool something down, it's going to contract. It's pretty much that simple. You heat something up, it expands. You cool something down, it contracts, okay? Um, this little picture right here kind of tells us what we need to know about this. Suppose I have some bar right here that starts off at a temperature T naught, that initially has a length L naught, let's say it's a metal bar or something like that. If we increase the temperature by some amount delta T, that delta T could be on the Kelvin scale or the Celsius scale. One thing I forgot to mention above is that the temperature differences, like one degree Kelvin and one degree Celsius, those mean the same thing, okay? Um, the absolute value of them is different, but um, yeah, so for a given increase in temperature, delta T, you get a fixed amount of change in length for the object. 
If you double that temperature change, you get twice as much. It's also the case that that temperature change, uh, sorry, that the change in length is also proportional to the initial length of the object. Meaning, if I take an object at temperature T naught with a with a length L naught, and I increase the temperature, then the object is going to expand by some delta L. But that if I take an object that was twice as long to begin with, and I increase it by the same temperature amount, that that other object that was longer to begin with is going to have twice as much of an expansion. Okay, And given these two ideas, you can produce this equation here that says that uh, change in length is proportional to, so the, the, the statement that would come before this would be that change in length would be proportional to, so that's just like a proportionality symbol, uh, the initial length and the temperature, right? So as, as the temperature increases, the object expands the longer the initial length. But then the way you turn that into an equation, you need to have some kind of a constant. The constant in this case is alpha. These two symbols look really similar to each other, but they are definitely different. Um, and, and that tells you, uh, well, that a change in length is produced by alpha, which they're calling here the coefficient of linear expansion, and you multiply by the initial length, and then you multiply by the temperature change. It's pretty simple. Why does this happen? At the molecular level, uh, in a metal, for example, um, you, you have metals, they tend to arrange themselves. These little things here are atoms, right? So this could be lead atoms, or they could be silver atoms, or whatever. And the springs here, represent um, the average distance between atoms. They also represent um, kind of like bonds between the atoms, you might say. And when an object is at some temperature, these molecules don't sit still, right? They basically wiggle back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, they all do. They're all wiggling this way and they're wiggling that way and they're wiggling this way. They're wiggling in three dimensions. And by wiggling back and forth, they have the effect of expanding the size of the solid. So if you increase the temperature by some amount, then the distance that they're wiggling gets bigger. And now maybe they're wiggling like this, and they're wiggling like this, and they're wiggling like this over a larger um, kind of thing. What's that gonna do? Well, it's gonna have the effect of spacing out the atoms a little bit more. And as a result of that, the whole system is going to expand, okay? Now, this is only true for moderate temperature changes. Over massive temperature changes, you can do things like melt the object. Like, so here's an example of a, um, is this part of the same picture? No, it's not, I can make this bigger. Here's an example of railroad tracks, and there's a little arrow pointing down right here. Um, and the idea is that these tracks have a very small gap inside of them right here. The gap doesn't really disrupt the, um, the train as it goes over them, although there will be some sound that's made as the train rolls over this gap. But what they allow to happen is that on a really hot day, when the track expands, you know, and it's not just this piece that's gonna expand, but that piece is gonna expand too. You've got a little tiny gap in here so that there's room for the expansion to occur. And that makes it so that the, the train tracks don't buckle and warp and stuff like that. You see things like this on bridges too, right? On bridges that are made of concrete, for example, there's little metal spacers in between them. You'll have like, um, you'll have a piece portion of the bridge that's made of like concrete or asphalt or something like that. But then you'll have like some piece of metal. And sometimes they're, they're designed like, I know on some bridges I've seen, they're kind of designed like little teeth. Have you guys seen these before? Like on one side you'll have teeth like this and then you'll have the other portion of the, the bridge over here. And then you'll have these other teeth that kind of intersect the other teeth, but leave a gap between the two of them. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys did this before, right? So this would be like, so this is a bridge. Bridge. God. G E. Nope, that's what was wrong. I put two, two Gs in there. There's some problem there. So this is like a bridge. This portion would be concrete. This portion would be concrete or asphalt or whatever it's made out of. But then this piece right here would be metal. And there's just a gap, just like on this, there's a gap so that when the concrete expands, um, there's some room for, uh, uh, you know, 
And then, of course, you notice this if you're driving over these type of bridges too, right? You'll hear like your car will, will bump across the little piece right here, right? And those are designed for the same reason, for uh, thermal expansion. There's another really neat uh, effect of this, and this is something where I should just go get a video for this actually instead of showing this picture. Okay, during the break, I'll probably find a video of someone doing this demo. An interesting effect of this is that um, if you take two different metals, okay, and why, why do two different metals matter? I'll pull this over here. So let's look at these equations real quick. This equation says that the change in length is equal to alpha, which is a coefficient. Okay, what's the coefficient? Here's the coefficient. So aluminum has a coefficient of 2.4 times 10 to the negative 5. And that's per degree Celsius. So the change in length is going to be for every degree Celsius change, right? For one degree Celsius change, this is the change in length. Does that make sense? It's going to expand by 2.4 times 10 to the negative 5 whatever unit. Meters would be a good one to use, right? So that's a tiny change, right? You're talking about microns, like 24 microns. So things do not expand a lot. They have very small changes. And for all of the objects that are that are chosen here for this list, they're all pretty close to each other. So quartz is like glass, right? It looks like it doesn't expand nearly as much as metal does. Why would that be? Why would, why would quartz not expand as much as a metal does? Glass, same thing. Why would that be? Can you see that from these numbers, or am I expecting too much here? This is 2.4. This is 0 0.04, right? So the aluminum is clearly going to expand a lot more on, based on temperature by a factor of a lot, 60 or something. 600 or 60? If you multiply by 100, you get 4. No, it's, it's like 60. Quartz has different structures. So you're talking about like at the molecular level. Yeah, maybe something like that. Um, anyway, but the other thing to notice here is that even between aluminum and brass, there's a difference, right? So if you take a piece of metal and you fuse it together so that one piece of the metal is maybe be like on top, maybe this is aluminum and maybe this piece right here is like copper, for example then the amount by which their lengths are going to change when subjected to heat is going to be different. So when heated, metal 2 expands more than metal 1. OK, so I've, I've inverted these here. So this one should have actually been here. Let me just fix it. Um, so that's copper, and then that's aluminum. Does it have to do with their melting points? I don't know the answer to that question. It might. Um, but if the objects actually start to melt, I don't know. So do you, you can go look it up. Look up the melting points of these three objects if you want, and we can compare them. So look up the melting point of aluminum, brass, and copper, and we can put them side by side with this, and we can look it up and see. Um, OK, so copper, aluminum, they're welded together. Whenever you heat them up, the strip is going to bend. Uh, and the reason why the strip is going to bend is because well, let me draw like this. I don't know how well I can draw this. If I have if I have a piece of metal and one object is going to get shorter than the other one is, uh, like when heated, metal 2 expands more than metal 1, then the only way they can stay touching each other is for them to kind of form a circular shape. Does that make sense? Okay, I see you put them up, put the things into the chat, Baron. The only way for them to stay welded together is for them to bend in a circular shape. Does that make sense to you guys? The idea is like, if I take if I take um, a flat, so I've got this surface, and I've got the surface below it, like this. If you heat it up, and the bottom one expands more, which is what's happening in this picture, you can imagine a scenario when you get something like this occur, where you've got, okay, now it's gotten longer, like that, but then. If it's like the inside of a circle, for example, or any other type of curve, 
it should be pretty obvious from this picture that I've drawn, as crude as it is, that the length of the red is shorter than the length of the black now, right? When before they started off at the exact same length, right? So as a result, it can bend. And because it can do this, you can design a thermometer based on this. And like old thermostats, like I don't have one of these in my house because we live in California and maybe none of you guys do too, but I know a lot of the houses I lived when I lived in Oklahoma would have a thermostat that was based on this where there'd be literally a crank that you'd use to change the temperature. And inside of the, the thermostat in the house was literally a piece of metal like this. And basically like you'd, you'd turn it up to let's say 75 degrees in the winter, you're trying to heat the house or something like that. And as soon as the temperature reached that point, it, it would be based on this metal thing inside of it basically. And it would turn on and off based on that. Okay, let's look at the melting point that you guys asked about. Okay, so you're saying the melting point of aluminum is uh, 6, 6, go ahead. So the things that have a higher melting point seem to have a lower coefficient. What about steel? Okay, saying he said quartz was sixteen seventy. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, they like to do that kind of stuff in this book. Most most likely, the reason why they even put this one in here is because it shows up in your homework problems. Keep in mind, this is something you have to look up in a table. Um, it's not something that you're going to be able to determine. That's an interesting question. That makes a lot of sense too. That as the temperature at which something melts goes up its rate of linear expansion goes down. Hmm. That's interesting. That's a good question. Stainless steel, you're saying, is 1375 to 1530. We should put it, yeah, so it seems consistent. Even if you put, if, even if you chose the, the lower bound on that, it would still work. But, uh, yeah. Okay, it's 11 a.m. Um, might as well take a break right now. Let's take a 10 minute break. Start again at 1110. And I will find a video of this right here so that it's not just a picture uh, over the break. 